กะดิพาทิสะหัมปะทิคัตันชะลิยันดิวารังอายาชะตาสันทิตาสัทธาภาราจักขจัตติกาเดเสทุดามังอนุคัมปิมังพะจังนัมโมทัสสะปะโกวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนัมโมทัสสะปะโกวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนัมโมทัสสะปะโกวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะปุรังดัมมังสังฆังนัมมาสัมมิเมื่อที่จิมเริ่มจะแอคดับฉันจำได้เรื่องราวของเสียงในเรื่องของเสียงของสองผู้ศาสนาที่เดินเข้าไปในบ้านแล้วเสียงของสองเด็กเบิร์ดที่ฉันได้ยินในบ้านและเขาคิดว่าเป็นความน่ารักที่ฉันได้ยินที่บ้านและเขาคิดว่าเป็นความน่ารักที่ฉันได้ยินในบ้านและเขาคิดว่าเป็นความน่ารักที่ฉันได้ยินในบ้านและเขาคิดว่าเป็นความน่ารักที่ฉันได้ยินในบ้านและเขาคิดว่าเป็นความน่ารักที่ฉันได้ยินในบ้านและเขาคิดว่าเป็นความน่ารัก And then the house inspector came and told them that it was a, a smoke alarm that was out of batteries, <laughs> and they started getting very annoyed <laughs> for the next few weeks until they found out which one it was. So perception is a significant uh, factor in how we react. So I appreciate the recollection that. When sounds come from a heating system or a leaf blower, it's just another part of nature. And many of you will know the story of Ajahn Chah when he was told at the first monastery in England that there was a, uh, I think it was a band practice or something next door every now and again. And when people complained about it while meditating, he said, "Why are you going out and bothering the sound? The sound is just doing what it does. The sound isn't bothering you. You're going out and bothering it." So today, I wanted to speak to one of the most complex systems of thought in the Buddhist. Canon in the Buddhist teachings, and it was one that served as the centerpiece of Longpo Suchito's retreat titled "Beginning Dependent Origination for Advanced Meditators." And for those who don't know, this is a system of twelve links, which reveals how we move from. Ignorance into becoming birth and eventually into suffering. It's one of the most complex and intricate systems of psychology I think that's ever been formulated. It's brilliant, and there's a sutta where Venerable Ananda, the Buddha's attendant, says this dependent origination. Uh, it's I can. It's easily understood, and the Buddha says, "No, no, Venerable Ananda, this dependent origination is profound, hard to understand. It is because of not understanding dependent origination that this generation wanders, bound by craving." And so we're going to try to cover it in 25 minutes or less. <laughs> Just the basics. When people asked Longpo Cha about dependent origination and if one had to become attuned to every single step within its twelve links, he said, "You don't have to 
know everyone int intimately. It's a bit like falling out of a tree and counting every branch on the way down. You just have to know that when you hit the ground, it hurts. Basically, when you begin with ignorance, the first link, you end with suffering, the last. And in one sense, that can be enough for practice much of the time, because that is effectively the Four Noble Truths, seeing how our craving and thirst and clinging to the world lead us to dukkha, to unnecessary suffering, struggle. But it's also a profound tool to use in framing experience and understanding how we move into suffering again and again, stress. And when the Buddha speaks about previous enlightened Buddhas, previous beings who have come to realize full liberation of heart, this is always the insight, these 12 links. And obviously, each enlightened being most likely doesn't articulate them in exactly the same way, but this process is timeless. And when you sit in Bodh Gaya at the site of the Buddha's enlightenment, every morning and evening, you can hear the Pali, avicca pachaya sankara, sankara pachaya vinyana, and they go back and forth from ignorance leading to volitional formations, leading to sense consciousness, leading to mentality and materiality, leading to the six sense bases, leading to contact of the sense bases, leading to feeling tone, leading to craving, to becoming, to birth, to aging, death, and suffering. And then they go back and say, with the cessation of ignorance comes the cessation of sankhara, and so on. From the first link, as they cease, the subsequent ones fade too. And this was the secret, was in the Buddha's time, there were so many samanas, renunciants, teachers. And always they would question the Buddha, are you an atavada, which uh, do you preach a self, do you preach existence, or do you preach non-existence, annihilation of the self after death? And the Buddha said, neither. I don't fall into either extreme, but rather I say with ignorance as a condition, there is formations, with formations as a condition, there is consciousness. And the restraint of this teacher to not fall into these easily ossified, fossilized categories, extremes, but rather to say, look, I'm not here to tell you, to describe in detail the self you're letting go of or what comes after that, but rather here's the phenomenological process by which you suffer and let it go, and then that handful of leaves has served its purpose. The teachings meant to alleviate dukkha have brought fruit, and this is the purpose of the teaching. And that's enough. What you come to when the heart is liberated speaks for itself. So the first link in this is avijja, ignorance. And in Buddhism, we don't have a creator god. In some sense, ignorance is the creator. But it's timeless, without beginning. The Buddha says this samsara is without, be is without discernible beginning. And... When we hear the word samsara, the cycle of birth and death, we often think of it as this external thing, this round which these little homunculus within us jumps from body to body or moment to moment. But rather, samsara in Buddhism is something we do. It's an action we continue through craving and ignorance. And when we stop doing it, that's enough to let what manifests beyond that be, or what is existence beyond, existent beyond the manifest to be experienced. And the first link, avijja, ignorance, is ignorance of the Four Noble Truths as an applied skill. So that can be a bit 
hard to understand right off the bat, but what it means is the Four Noble Truths, their first directive is to comprehend suffering, the second to let go of its source, craving, the third to realize peace, and the fourth to develop the path. And when this is something we can know intellectually, but to learn to apply it to our experience, to see clearly the dukkha, the stress in, in our unwholesome action, to see what craving and thirst is leading us to act in that way and to let go of it into peace. This is something that takes a lifetime, it takes many lifetimes. It's an applied skill and ignorance of that applied skill is why we keep on launching ourselves into suffering. So the second link is sankhara, which is volitional formations, the quintessential element of which is intention. It's the going out searching. And there's a famous teacher named, uh, I think, Longpur Foon. Oh no, Longpur Dun. And he said, the source of suffering is the mind looking outside of itself for happiness or going outside of itself. The path to the end of suffering is the mind watching itself. So I was always confused. How does ignorance link to sankhara? How does ignorance lead to this going out with volitional formations, with intention? And I think what it is, there's a sutta where the Buddha says, those samanas, those recluses that do not understand this is suffering, this is the origin, this is the cessation, and this is the path to the end of suffering. They delight in fabrications. Delighting in fabrications, they fabricate fabrications. Fabricating fabrications, they fall off the precipice of suffering. So when we don't see the suffering in what we do clearly, when we don't perceive how to let go, when we don't see anything beyond it in terms of the third noble truth of peace, when we're bound and blinded by this ignorance, then we go and search and buy into things and we create action which we don't need to create. And it's interesting to see as we practice this begin to manifest where not only do your actions become more refined, where suddenly you realize all the suffering that comes from expressing anger, from lashing out. Because as you meditate, you see clearly after you've launched into an unwholesome intention how it the residue stays with you, what suffering it leads to. And so you stop doing it. It's that simple. You see the Four Noble Truths. Ignorance is abandoned and you don't create new sankhara. You, don't, you aren't born again into an action. But it also manifests throughout our lives in other ways. Uh, my parents have a joke where they say Buddhism ruins everything for them in the sense that, hold this skillfully, <laughs> in the sense that you find that the things you used to enjoy just seem kind of trivial now. M going to the movies isn't, it's kind of loud and annoying. Um, you find that, you know, a lot of the things that used to kind of excite you, you find that there's more subtle forms of happiness which actually hold a lot more joy. And this isn't to say that when we let go of ignorance that we stop acting, but it's an action that comes from a profoundly deep place of giving and selflessness rather than craving. So we stop creating sankhara based on ignorance. With the cessation of ignorance comes the cessation of sankhara. In another sutta, the Buddha says that each link, if seen in line with the Four Noble Truths, can disappear right there. So whenever we manage to catch this cycle in its midst, there's a chance to disengage for that chain, this shackle of dependent origination to fall off. And there's a few moments where that's really key, a few links which are especially good to pay attention to. So after volitional formations, there's consciousness, sense consciousness. Oh, sorry, then there's mental, yeah, consciousness. Then mentality and materiality, name and form. And in the Buddhist conception, this would actually mean a body which we take on. But it also means, because dependent origination 
can be conceived of as a process that occurs through many lifetimes if you believe in rebirth, which you don't have to to practice, or it can be considered how we take birth every single day. How many beings have you been today? How many roles have you played? How many things have you been born into? Have you been a mother, a sister, a daughter, an enemy, a friend, a benefactor, a guilty, a sacrifice? How many roles are you born into? How many lives do you live? And this is one of the most useful places to look at this in. And in terms of that linkage, it's useful to see how those links play out. Um, I'll go, one of the most interesting ones is after this process moves through into craving, there's the process of birth. And in the sense of a day-to-day -day experience, birth is the moment of peak dopamine. And they've measured this. On a shopping trip, it's right when you go to the cash register, right before you purchase. That's birth in a day-to-day -day context. So we can look at this whole process within our lives right now. But name and form, uh, even the form outside of ourselves and the consciousness of that lead to the sense bases. So our experience of these senses, which lead to contact. And contact leads to feeling, the feeling tone, pleasant, painful, neutral. And this link between feeling and craving, which is the next, this is one of the keys because most teachers will point to this as the point where we have a chance to really disengage from the chain. Can you observe a feeling come up and note it? Oh, this is pleasant. But then that sense of craving where from a pleasant feeling, you begin to watch yourself seek it, to orient yourself towards pursuing it more. That's what creates the cascade into suffering or continues it. So a pleasant feeling leads to craving for that, which leads to upadana, becoming, which leads to birth. So this sense of vaguely feeling a pleasant feeling, orienting ourselves towards it, and then watching our minds gather momentum. And birth is where you've made the decision. You have a craving for something, and by the end of the meditation, you're like, I'm gonna go get that pizza. That's birth. And this is, uh, but you can catch it at craving. You can catch it and break it right there by just noting feeling. This is a pleasant feeling or this is a painful feeling. And that's enough just to notice that and sit with it and not create more karma. And that lets you disengage and the whole chain ceases. This is one really useful way to use the teaching of dependent origination is take for a day or an hour or a sit one link and note every time you pass that link. Can you note every time you're born in a day, be like, oh, this is birth, here we are. I've just started to yell at the person or I've just pressed send on the email. That's a terrible birth, I think. Many of us have had that one. <laughs> um, or this is even the state of clinging or becoming between craving and birth. Can you notice just the gathering of momentum where you're debating, should I, shouldn't I, and then you do. That's becoming. So noting and planting a flag every time you hit one of those links. And then after birth comes sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, death, suffering, the whole, the whole shebang. And I'm reminded by, of Longpar Punadamo, and I've mentioned this before, who said that people look at us Buddhists and say, you're so pessimistic. All you Buddhists talk about is suffering. And he said, that's not fair. We also talk about uh, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. <laughs> and, um, but it's all grouped there because that's the end. And you can notice that too. Because often when the flush of birth fades, there's a sense of a void, of dryness, of what next. 
And what we do is we jump to the next birth, to the next sankara. We start the cycle over because we don't want to just stay there with that moment of quiet. But we find that if you note, okay, this is, this is death, this is suffering, this is cessation, or rather this is the ending of a birth. After the dryness, after the sense of emptiness, if you let it move through you without reacting and creating new karma, just wait. Patient endurance, the Buddha said, is the supreme quality. If you just wait, then you find you haven't created a new birth right away. And there's actually a quiet sense of peace that begins to well up from below this. So this is the out, is that when you disengage, when you dismantle this chain, when you note a link rather than buying into the next, the chains fall. And, you know, as a metaphor I often use is you let go of what you're clinging to and realize that your hands are filled with sunlight. And that takes restraint. It takes holding back from buying into a new birth. So can you plant a flag at a certain moment in that chain? One really useful thing to notice is as you practice, you might notice that the cascade of suffering the Buddha talks about, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, no longer applies completely. Because you might find after a few years, despair no longer applies. You no longer despair. Like things still suck sometimes, they're still suffering, but it's not you don't buy into the khandas completely. There's a sense of distance where there's not despair and to note that and how our suffering quietly becomes less. Another really useful thing to look at in terms of dependent origination is um, how it manifests that seeking mind in meditation for the next birth. And Ajahn Jeff compares it to you can tell when the mind's become a bit bored of a certain object, it'll be like an inchworm where it has its sort of butt on one leaf, but it's sort of searching around for the next leaf. And you can feel that motion in the mind and really then to bring it back and notice what's happening. Another really important thing to realize about this chain of dependent origination is how contact occurs halfway through which is, implies that there are six links that happen before we even contact reality. And that's to say that when we move into the world, often we are already primed for what we want to see. Sankara has already been created. So we don't go into the world looking as blank slates or looking at it as completely objective reality. Rather, we move into the world looking for something. So can you notice how you encounter the world. This morning, are you looking for the thing to be angry at or to want? And anything that comes up, you'll notice there's something to be annoyed about. And just to be able to backtrack and say, okay, I see what's happening. I'm going to go upstream and see how there's a Sankara operating that wants to feel angry or that wants to hunger after something. That's what's really happening. It's not my spouse, it's not my child, um, it's not the coworker. There's something in me which wants to be angry. And that's a profound insight to see that we can go upstream and as we affect our intention, and this is the importance of sitting for at least 20 minutes every morning. Maybe you're more of a night owl and you can have your longer sit in the evening, but 20 minutes in the morning is basic hygiene because that's the only way you can move upstream to your intention and alter your orientation for the day. It's also why you can consider taking refuge in precepts in the morning. It's also why bowing first thing when you get up is a good idea. You're altering intention right from the get-go. Another really useful thing 
is that when the Buddha speaks about applying the Four Noble Truths framework to each link and disengaging, when he talks about knowing this is, for example, contact, this is the origin of contact, this is the cessation of contact, this is the path to the cessation, in the sense of sense contact, what does it really mean to know contact? That's the naming of it. Okay, this is the senses. And to be able to know contact in full. So if you find that you're really focusing on one sense door, like sight, or like seeking a certain smell or taste, can you expand to all six sense doors? Just allow your field of awareness to broaden. And somehow your mind has to be quite narrow and oriented. That's the essence of Sankara. It narrows and orients like an arrow to make it through these 12 links. But if you widen, if you expand, can you feel all your senses in this moment? You sort of hamstring the whole process because you're just becoming aware of contact as contact in its fullness. And so you don't necessarily get caught into feeling. Or if you are into feeling, can you notice that? And in some sense, people can look at what the Buddha is articulating here and wonder what's beyond it. Suffering is articulated in such detail. What happens when this link falls apart? And last weekend, um, I was speaking about the Buddhist conception of fire and light and how the Buddhist word for cessation for peace is nibbana, which means to cool. And in a Northern European culture, which much of our culture is influenced by, the going out of a flame meant death and darkness. And so we have this intuition when we hear the word nibbana, coolness, cessation, it's just darkness. Whereas you have to realize the Buddhist teachings were given in Vedic India. Not only was it really hot, but also there was this sense of this, it was coming in the context of a people that strongly believed in more below the surface. And so when a fire went out, it didn't become nothing. And what fire was conceived of is there was a, uh, Ajahn Tanisro goes into this in The Mind Like Fire Unbound, a book, where there was conceived of as this fire god named Agni, this element of heat that pervaded all things. And fire was the binding and agitation and tra entrapment of Agni. But when fire goes out, it didn't become nothing. It just expanded to be ever and all pervading once again. So emptiness, cessation in Buddhism, sunyata, is not emptiness of everything. It's emptiness of self, but being filled with reality. When these links dismantle, you're not left with nothing. And you get a sense that it just takes longer for that sense of light and brightness of heart to come, and you have to hold still long enough for it to manifest. And that's restraint. And the Buddha points to this. We know about the three characteristics in Buddhism of anicca, impermanence, anatta, not self, and dukkha, suffering. This vortex of change we're surrounded by. But the Buddha holds up these other qualities of the Dhamma. It's in the Dhamma Niyama Sutta, uh, Samyutta Nikaya 12.20. And he says, with birth as a condition, there is aging and death. And he goes through the entire 12 links. And then he says, whether or not, or not a Tathagata arises in the world. And it's worth stopping here and noting that's what the Buddha called himself, the Tathagata, which means the thus gone or the thus come, thus, ta ta ta. It's, it's a word so basic, so grounding, it, it almost is just onomatopoeic, ta ta, thus, this is beyond words. Whether or not a tathagata arises in the world, this element of Dhamma remains. The thusness of Dhamma, the orderless, orderliness of Dhamma, dependent, this, that, conditionality, basically dependent origination. Titawasa datu, dhamma titata, dhamma niyamata, itapachayata. And then he says, the actuality in this, the inerrancy in this, the not otherwiseness of this, that is dependent origination. 
ta ta ta, the not the actuality, awi ta ta ta, the not otherwiseness, ananya ta ta, the thusness, or the not, not other. Paticca samuppada, dependent origination. And in those moments, he's pointing to how, I think, when you see this chain operating, this process, there's a groundedness in that. When you understand how your suffering comes into be, being, there's a sense of peace and resting and release. And you really sense this when you suddenly make a connection between, why am I so angry today? And then you, you realize, oh, I, I didn't actually get that much sleep. Even in that small connection of understanding conditionality, there's a sense of like, it's not wrong. Of course it's like this. This is the groundedness of dependent origination. Or when you know someone and you just cannot figure out how they could be like they are. How could they be so angry, ignorant, biased? And then you learn about their childhood or what's happening at home. You understand the conditionality that's brought them there. There's a sense of, oh, of course. And that's the ta-ta-ta, thus. That's the ground. And so for all this, these three characteristics of changeability, of not-self, of dukkha, that the Buddha points to in terms of what's swirling around us, that actual process of swirling is orderly. It operates by these 12 links. And the mind and heart that know that sense ground. There's a solid ground in that phenomenological truth. This is how the world operates. Ta, ta, ta. And it's such a simple word. It's such a simple grounding. It's almost beyond words. And so the Buddha gives us a word that is, it could be no more basic. It could be no more simple. Ta, ta, ta. And there's a really beautiful episode where the Buddha, after his enlightenment, is wandering to go teach his former disciples. And a other mendicant comes named Upaka and passes him on the road. And he says, what are you? Are you, who is your teacher um, to the Buddha? And the Buddha basically says, I have no teacher. In a world gone blind, I've come to beat the drum of the deathless. And for me, this is the drum, ta, ta, ta. And then Upaka says, pretty much, okay, good for you, and he wanders off. <laughs> and, and then the Buddha spends the next like few weeks figuring out how to teach this in a way people will actually pay attention to. And that's where the first discourse comes from. But the first and foremost thing was beating that drum of the deathless. So the links can seem confusing, the articulation can seem focused on how we create suffering. But when the mind releases and knows it, there's a sense of solidity, of thusness, of ground. And I wish all of you uh, safe travels to that ground. Well, we'd have Q&A, but I've got to go. Um, <laughs> I, have, uh, I actually have to go travel right now. So you all can ask your, each other questions over coffee, which would be great about thusness and the dependent origination links. Um, but before we do, um, a few brief things. Uh, first, I won't be here next week, but we'll hopefully be joined on Zoom by Sangye Kadro. Uh, very senior Tibetan nun from Sarvasti Abbey. Um, this week I'm going to China with Ajin Kovilo for a monastic conference there. Uh, and it might be one of the, well, anyways, it, it'll, Ajin Jayasara will be there and we'll be gone for about a week. Um, but here the next Saturday after that. But it'll be a really special teaching next Saturday. So I still encourage people, please feel, you know, encouraged to come. Um, more importantly, uh, who here's been to Servasti Abbey? Okay. 
So this is a Tibetan abbey of 20 nuns and about five male monastics over on the east side of the state um, near Spokane, where I was born or grew up, wasn't born. But um, it's an amazing community. And last year, a senior Tibetan Geshe named, uh, well, his title, as people know him, there's Geshe La, just a gem of a human being, one of the most impressive men I've ever met. And on Tuesday night, he uh, went on a walk, and we think he, he didn't come back. And we think he may just be lost in the woods, but it's been many days now, and they've had a search and rescue, and they haven't found him. And um, I'm pretty sure his mind is in a better place than many of ours. But uh, today, maybe we can dedicate to him um, our chant of closing, and maybe people can keep in their hearts his situation uh, and hope for a safe return. But we also, uh, I want to give a chance for the blessing braid and other chanting requests to be made so that we can hold others in our hearts. So maybe Matt can run the mic back there. And in the meantime, do people have other names they'd like to bring to mind right now? Just people we can dedicate our practice to? Samak. Gustav? H Gustav. Ustav. 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 Sorry. Husan. Oh my God. It's so embarrassing. It's just, it's, it, it's a long way to hear. I'm sorry. Husa. Oh, well, that was easy. <laughs> okay. Husa. William, John's dad, just passed. And um, John and Jendi. Cheryl? Uh, Bodhi. Uh, William, who's likely in the process of dying, may be the same person you just mentioned. It is. Bodhi, dog wounded by coyote, spread metta for recovery in heart and mind. Francesco Marcel, passed recently, spread loving kindness. Geshe-la, currently missing outside of Srivasti, spread care. And that was also from you. Other names? Ellen, recovering. And uh, also let's dedicate merit to Grace, who's off for a long period of monastery trips, wherever she is. There she is. So good luck, Grace, and go like circle around her after this and wish her, wish her the best. Okay. Today, uh, let's chant in dedication to all these. True and False Refuges, page 69. And once again, if you're joining on Zoom, you can find the link in the chat, page 69. Handamayam kema kema sarna gamanang pari dipi kagatayo banamase. Bahung we saranang yanti pa batani wanani cha Aramaruka chetyani manusabaya tajita Too many refuges they go To mountain slopes and forest glades To parkland shrines and sacred sites People overcome by fear. Netang ko saranang kemang. Netang saranang utamang. Netang sarana agama sabadu kapamujati. Such a refuge is not secure. Such a refuge is not supreme. Such a refuge does not bring. Complete release from suffering. Yo cha budan cha dhamman cha songan cha saranam gato. Cha tari ariya sachani samapanyaya pasati. Whoever goes to refuge in the triple gem sees with right discernment the four noble truths. Dukang dukha sammu padang dukha sa cha atikamang Aryan cha gikang magang dukha pasamagaminang Suffering and its origin and that which lies beyond The noble eightfold path that leads the way to suffering's end Etang ko saranang kemang Etang saranang utamang, 
etang saranang agama sa baduka pamujati. Such a refuge is secure, such a refuge is supreme, such a refuge truly brings complete release from all suffering. Okay, so we'll skip introductions of new folks today. I'm sorry, but, um, oh, I love the introductions. Who's new? Um, if you've been here three times or less,